about machine learning and real world healthcare. So, I, which is actually what this the talk that we're going to give is supposed to be about. Supposed to be about. So, here's the fun part. There's actually very, very. There was a lot of stories about the promises of machine learning for healthcare. There's actually you can count on pretty much one hand the cases of a computational model actually being used in a real world healthcare system. Not the behind the scenes and not saying, you know, well, in the EMR we predict the claims and the amount, but actual, this is something which when you go to a doctor or a nurse, there is a machine learning model or computational model being applied and decisions being made on it. You can count on like one hand, give or take. There's a lot of things which are currently in the wings, a lot of them with vision, but some of them also with the more um, holistic aspects. What do I mean by holistic? So in health, healthcare, you have what are known as EHRs, electronic health records. They're basically all of the information the system has about you. It's what uh, doctors have you visited, what did you tell them, what are the codes, everything. What's the problem? Every single country has its own EHRs in different ways. Generally, each different hospital has its in its own different ways. In many cases, each different insurance system and doctor has it in its own different ways, and each of these are completely different ways. So there is a huge amount of uh, trouble in standardizing and connecting all of these things. If I wanted to say, okay, let's find everybody who took uh, anti-cancer medicine, is there any chance that that increases the risk of, um, I don't know, stroke? Then in some cases, it might be in their insurance. It might be their prescription. In some cases, it's a lot worse. Why is it worse? Because in most cases, in most countries, the health system is very fragmented. In Israel, we actually, our system is considered one of the best in the world because despite being very underfunded, it's extremely efficient. Also, it helps that we have like a really young population, which is kind of better than anything else. And like we're super inbred, there are lots of uh, interesting diseases here, but we're relatively young, so that's better than anything else for healthcare. So what's the advantage here? If you're in the US, you might have, uh, say, something like Kaiser with about 150 million people's insurance claims. What's the problem? They can't necessarily connect that, your insurance claim, i.e., uh, you know, applying for something, to what doctors did you go to, what did the doctor diagnose, what drugs did you actually buy? What did you do at the hospital? Like, think about it. You can't necessarily connect what the drugs that somebody bought to their prescription, to the doctor visits, to the hospital visits, to the diagnosis. So you might have somebody with cancer and you don't know what procedures did they do, what did they buy. You don't necessarily have it, except for some countries, including Israel. We actually have uh, the third and fifth, fifth or seventh largest uh, EHR records in the world are actually here in Israel, with uh, Khalid being the second or third largest, and Maccabi uh, being five or seven, and so on, because even though they don't have, let's say, uh, 50 million people, it's, it's considered large in terms of being integrated. I.e., they have under the same roof, they have the date of the hospital, the insurance, the medical claims, everything. And at least in theory, it's standardized because it is under one roof. Again, I say in theory because, you know, I don't know who was here for the morning talk, but there is, when they say standardized, it's, uh, you know, lies. So, but what's amazing about it is the fact that we can apply, that uh, Israel is an amazing test case for uh, trying to apply machine learning to different healthcare problems, which is something that uh, we've done as well at uh, Spark Beyond. For example, on colorectal cancer, osteoporosis, hospital readmissions, uh, another ongoing use case, because we have a very rare opportunity here. Uh, groups like Clalit have uh, research groups. So again, their goal is, thankfully, very much al actually aligned with healthcare. In the US, the goal is overall make more, m not necessarily, but it's basically, you could say in many cases, it's make more profit or make more money, which is not the same as reduce costs. When you have it as a public healthcare group, you don't have the issue with, you know, the overall motivation being, well, we could treat people better, but that'll cost us a bit more. And, you know, if they go to the hospital, we're not paying for it, so maybe we don't want to spend money into optimizing that. Here, they have, the incentives are much more aligned, and it makes it easier for researchers to, you know, do good ethical health, public healthcare research. And again, we have a gold mine for that, because we have multiple, year, we have multiple years of uh, digitalized data. We have a group which wants to push it, the various research groups. And we have, uh, you know, People being people, i.e. being alive, then getting sick and dying, or dying and, uh, while being sick, not necessarily in that order, which is, you know, kind of interesting. 
So that's the short version. Uh, I can go into a bit more detail about, you know, some of the different uh, aspects of machine learning with healthcare. Does anybody wants to go up instead of me? Dan, offer. Hello. Okay, so maybe just one interesting uh, caveat. So in any type of machine learning model, so I don't know how much experience the people here have, but okay, so you have a bit of a spectrum when it comes to explaining your models in terms of interpretability and accountability. In some cases, like let's say you're, maybe you're doing an online app to predict uh, if your uh, machine will fail or predicting if this is a picture of a cow or not. In these cases, you don't really care about explainability or interpretability. You have lots of data. You, or, you know, even better example, recommend the systems for those who know, the, know them, like you know, Netflix saying, people who watch this will watch this. If it's good, then they recommend more movies. You're more likely to watch it. If it keeps get recommending good things, you're more likely to subscribe and make them more money. That's easy to evaluate, and you have, they have a huge amount of data. And you know, it might be nice to explain it, but in the end, you know, they get the feedback quickly. They have lots of data, and there's a very and if it makes a wrong recommendation, you know, well, whatever. So we recommended the wrong movie out of the dozen they showed them that day, or they said people who like a toaster might like to buy a toaster. You don't quite care as much. You have the metric in the end, and you have the feedback. What's the problem? What happens when your decisions are expensive? Like, let's say, where do I put a new retail store location? Or which of my customers are likely to churn and I have, let's say, a $5,000 package to keep them uh, with me? Or let's say, uh, who's going to have colorectal cancer and should be asked to come for a colonoscopy early, which is, you know, it's not a fun procedure. And also, anyone who does it won't do it again. So even more so, so again, the, in these are cases where the mistakes are very expensive, the actions are expensive. You don't have a lot of them, so you need to be very justified, and the domains are complicated. I, what do I mean by complicated? I mean, among other things, you need to explain it very much in detail. If you go to a doctor and say, you know, where, or the FDA, well, we have this great, awesome model, and it'll totally show you uh, which of the people have colorectal cancer with a 97 score and an AUC of this and an accuracy of that and a Breyer score of uh, what have you. And it's, you know, like 9% of the time, 90% of the time, it's right 60% of the time. You know, they'll say, yeah, uh, well, go away. They would not listen to you or they would not act upon it. Even if you go to their uh, head of the healthcare system, put in this awesome model to show every doctor about every person in the ICU, this person is at risk. They'll say, yeah, there's a beeping number. I'm a doctor. I'm not going to listen to this uh, machine about that. It's like, you know, whatever. I know better. And in many cases, by the way, doctors are pretty good at what they do. When you're talking about somebody who's been working at a problem for 15 years, they know what they're doing in most cases. The problem is, of course, if you have, say, somebody who's working in it for one year or you don't have a doctor, different problem. So what you need in many cases is to be able to explain everything very much in detail. If you're going to them with a model, you have to show them very much, well, because of these factors. These are what the model is based on. The doctor will say, well, this factor and these drugs, they're just stuff we give to people who are sick and in the hospital. So it's just a proxy for age to so say, okay, we can remove it. The other things they might say, hey, we didn't know about that. That's interesting. We might want to research that. And in other cases, they might say, okay, so it's based on age. And uh, okay, just uh, an example for a novel feature was people who were unmarried were at much higher risk for having complications after being admitted to a hospital. And again, this sounds a bit silly, but it's actually, you know, it actually makes a lot of sense. To anyone who had the misfortune of being in a hospital, if you're not going there with someone else, you know, to make sure that you're getting the right drugs, that you're reg registered, that you're waiting at the entry, much higher chance of complications because, you know. And there's, a, there's also a proxy for other stuff, like, you know, if you're unmarried and say 70 or 60, then it's a chance that it's because you couldn't get married because of various other reasons. But it's still something which you can show and explain and analyze. And again, in the end, uh, you, want to make the, you need to go over these types of models in very, very, very great detail. It's not enough just to say what's the performance. You have to explain it. You have to go over it very much in detail with the domain experts. And uh, you need to convince them, and you need to convince the end user at the end. You need to show for every single prediction, not just talking about the overall model. You need to show about this specific person, which I'm saying, you know, this guy is uh, 45, and he should stow for a colonoscopy. The doctor will say, but you know, he's way too young. Why should I say that? And then you can show him, well, our model says that because of the fact that he had a polyp and because his eyes are blue and because uh, he's an Ashkenazi on three generations, much higher risk. And also, he recently reported stomachache. So the doctor says, okay, that actually makes somewhat sense. Maybe I will recommend him based on that. 
Or you might say, hey, this guy is actually not that. He just lied about that on his form, so I can ignore it safely in this specific case. Yes? So the question was about how do we get the explainability. So I know there are actually two things. One is in some cases, the, you might actually want to use two models. You might want to use a very simple linear model or decision tree model for just telling the doctors at the end of the day, you might have a case where you say, you know, at the end of the day, we can't implement this uh, system. We can, however, give a quick checklist to the doctors based around all of the features we've extracted from the data. Maybe they know, maybe they don't know. Here are these three to five things which they can go and act on. And in many cases, that's a very, very simple linear model. But in many cases, the ideal, and also what's easier to maintain, is having, you know, a proper machine learning model which we trained on the data. And, you know, once you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples, it's, it can actually learn to be a bit better than a doctor in some cases. So there are two parts. One is the explaining the overall model. As in that saying, for example, like let's say age is important for someone being at risk. But the other part is per sample or per interaction. Like it's not saying in general older people are more at risk. It's saying for this specific person, he's very old and he runs marathons. He's less at risk. If he has old but also runs marathons, then if anything, he has incredibly good health and genes and he's less at risk because there's an interaction there at the sample level. So there are lots of ways of showing it and also digging into it. And it's sound like for, uh, showing sample level uh, importance is a lot harder. It depends more on the model. Showing it at the high level, uh, like not, by the way, it's not just model level. Technically, it's like this, I like to call it the global level. Things which are important regardless of the model. Like something like age, it's important. Doesn't matter if you're using a linear model or using XGBoost or a deep learning model or a symbolic regression polynomial fit. It's still important overall. If you're using a linear model or an XGBoost, it might, for example, give more importance to or L1 or L2 regularization, basically different machine learning approaches. It might give more weight to, say, someone having a stroke or someone having Alzheimer's, for example, maybe because they correlate more or less, maybe because this and that. It will give different importance to different things, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're more or less important. But, the, but they can still serve as a relatively good proxy, and it also depends if you're using that model in production, then it still can help you explain it. Explaining at the sample level, it can be done either using the original model or using other models. For example, I think Shapley was mentioned as a nice approach. There are techniques like Lime. Like, given a specific sample, again, there are lots of ways of doing this. How high is it in the feature which is pro and minus? Show me the top five features which are activated in this example. Lots of different, again, the sample level is a lot more of a, it, 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 it depends a lot more on the use case. In general, though, we want to show the features per sample because in many cases, we'll have a human looking at it for the specific person, but you want to have very good global or model level features. Like you want those to be very well validated because again, if you have those and you know how they behave, then it's a lot easier to say, well, for this guy, the age is, you know, three standard deviations above the average and that's, higher risk in general, for example. 